Thank you, everyone. Um, I um, confess that I feel that I was showed up by Akhil Amar with his Lincoln socks. The, 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 uh, uh, the Reporters Committee has socks, too. Um, but I'm still a little bit stiff uh, in public, and I just can't bring myself to wear them yet. But um, they're on the website if you want to go check them out. Uh, it's a way to walk the First Amendment walk. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here with Jamil Floyd uh, and Larissa, and we're going to get right to it uh, because we have a lot to cover. <laughs> the last few months have been just a dizzying time uh, uh, in uh, for First Amendment watchers. So many different headlines and cases um, spitting out there. A newspaper raid in Kansas. A lawsuit in Florida brought by Disney against Governor DeSantis. A defamation case against Fox News that fizzles out into um, a, f a very large financial settlement for the company. Uh, Texas pulls TikTok off of state devices and networks. And then Montana decides, well, let's just ban TikTok entirely. Uh, two very closely watched cases involving social media moderation, one in Texas, one in Florida, and finally now the Biden administration has weighed in. And then just last Friday, two more developments. Uh, a federal appeals court in Fifth Circuit um, weighs in in a very interesting jawboning case about uh, government contacts with social media platforms around content they carry uh, and whether they cross the line. And in a case we'll, we'll hear Floyd talk about uh, where his law firm uh, representing Twitter. Um, we can still call it Twitter, right, in Philadelphia. We still call them the Philadelphia A's, right? So mm -hmm. I think we can still say Twitter. Uh, uh, Twitter sues the state of California over its uh, moderation law. Um, looking at this vast array of cases, uh, I'd like to go to each one of you um, to see where you view areas of defense, you know, where, where do we as press advocates have to be playing defense? And then where, where are the opportunities? You know, where we as press lawyers often gripe that the Supreme Court hasn't heard a libel case in 30 years and it's been, you know, 20 plus years since there's been any media case, but there is a lot going on out there nonetheless. Where are the opportunities? Jamil, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, well, okay, so first let me say th thanks for the invitation to, to be here. Thanks to Jeff and the National Constitution Center and everybody uh, who's involved in putting this together. Um, great to have such a big crowd, too. Um, I guess when I, when I think about you know, what the dangers are and what the opportunities are, um, I mean, I'm definitely worried about the erosion of particular doctrines. Like, for example, the, the, the right to speak anonymously, uh, I think is a hugely significant, important First Amendment right uh, that is uh, under a lot of pressure right now. Um, I, I worry about that. Uh, but to be honest, I actually think that uh, I spend more time worried about not the erosion of First Amendment doctrine, but rather the calcification of First Amendment doctrine. Um, you know, it goes without saying that we live in this era of incredible technological change, and the information ecosystem that we live in now is totally different um, from the one that existed even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and I think it's really important that we hold fast to First Amendment values, to the values that the First Amendment was meant to protect, like accountability uh, and tolerance and uh, autonomy, um, uh, truth-seeking and self-government. Like These are really important values, at least as important now as they were when the First Amendment was drafted. Um, but I think that First Amendment doctrine needs to be responsive to technological change. And um, now what we used to call the public square is almost entirely owned by private corporations. Um, uh, social media has democratized speech in a lot of ways, but it's also introduced a whole set of new pathologies. It's also true that surveillance technology, I think, has 
turned on its head the traditional relationship or the ideal relationship between the citizen and the government. Uh, and, and now I think it's increasingly fair to say that citizens are totally transparent to the government, not just to the government, but to powerful private actors as well. Uh, whereas those governments and powerful private actors are almost entirely opaque to us. Uh, and that's a complete reversal of the, uh, the appropriate democratic relationship. Um, I think the First Amendment has to be responsive uh, to all of that. And I worry when uh, I see um, other First Amendment advocates and First Amendment litigators uh, defending First Amendment doctrine as if it were the, do it, 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 the doctrine were an end in itself. You know, that doctrine exists to protect a set of values. Uh, and I don't, think, um, uh, I don't think we should lose sight of that set of values. Uh, that's what I, you know, if, I, if, I, if I'm up at night worrying about the First Amendment, I suppose that's probably the thing I'm worrying about. And, and Floyd, turning to you, we're looking at this vast array of, of headlines out there in our area, where do you see the opportunities to make, to make new law? And where do you worry about erosion? Yeah, I'm not looking for a lot of new law about the First Amendment. Uh, I think the direction we should be most focused on, or at least I think the courts should be most focused on, is preserving old law. Uh, not necessarily very old law, uh, but applying principles which have made us the, the most uh, free in terms of free speech, free press in the history of the world, uh, and not, not moving away from there. Now, you can't escape new problems with new uh, technology uh, and the like, uh, I think one of the most important issues <clears throat> that will surely be litigated, and not in just a few years, now and in, well into the future, uh, does relate to social media, necessarily relates to the degree to which social media will have, or at least more or less have, the same level of First Amendment protection, which means absence of government control. Um, as, as would otherwise be the case. I mean, social media is where a lot of, I, I know a lot of the action is uh, on the ground, but uh, in terms of First Amendment law, uh, I think we're going to have major cases, uh, you adverted to them, in the Supreme Court sooner rather than later <clears throat> about you know, questions like uh, can states uh, uh, require social media entities to have a, a sort of what we used to call a fairness doctrine. Uh, you put on one side, you want to put the other. You must put the other side on. That has been held unconstitutional as regards to the print press. The Supreme Court has said unambiguously, and it's not really being challenged at all now, <clears throat> you can't tell a newspaper what to print, period. You think it's not fair? that they're loaded in this direction or that direction. Too bad, read another newspaper, do something else. Uh, that, that really is a uh, uh, rather simplified comic book way, way to describe, but it's not, it's not wrong. And it's a very important question <clears throat> about how social media will be treated uh, in the courts. Uh, I mean, in my view, they have a very strong argument that they should get the same or something like the same amount of protection for some of the same sorts of reasons for fear of government control or government oversight. Uh, but that is not necessarily uh, how the law is going to move. The Supreme Court has one case they'll probably just decide in the next year relating to the Florida uh, uh, and Texas uh, legislatures, which have passed laws you know, designed to assure what the legislators in those states thought was fair. 
And so in an absolutely critical moment <clears throat> in the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, uh, a judge uh, asked uh, the lawyer for what I'll call the company, the media, social media company, are you saying that you could have up in, on the ground that you could favor the Democrats over the Republicans? And the answer was yes. The judge put that in the opinion of the Fifth Circuit, which I think is going to be reversed by the Supreme Court. But nonetheless, the court put that, thank you, uh, in, in the opinion uh, of, of the Fifth Circuit in a sort of, can you believe it? I mean, can you really believe that, that in response to that straightforward, flat question, the answer was, yes, you can do it. Now, no one now anymore, I think, thinks that the law is, certainly not is, or even plausibly is about to change so that a newspaper or a magazine or a book writer could be forced to answer the, the question, aren't you biased? Aren't, aren't you leaning? Uh, leaning? You're, you're in their pockets. All you do is praise them and denounce them. That situation for now, and I believe into the future, is really clear. But we, we don't have a great idea mm -hmm. what the court is going to say about social media on that. The other topic, the only other one I, mention, I would mention, <clears throat> is that we are likely to have more defamation cases which may, re which may reach the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, and there are at least uh, three of the, the most conservative members of the court who have said in so many words <clears throat> that they would, well, the two plus one that we know, uh, that, that they want to set aside what may well be the greatest press victory in American history, which is the New York Times versus Sullivan case of 1964. As the court has become more conservative and as some members of, of the court have become uh, unambiguously anti-press, uh, it makes it all the more likely that that, that case uh, may well come up before uh, this court. Uh, and uh, while for what it's worth, I don't think they're going to reverse uh, in effect or set aside New York Times against Sullivan. We don't know. Uh, it's in play. It's in play intellectually. It's in play juridically. And so uh, I think that's I think they will take one of these cases, some very sympathetic case from the point of view you know, of someone who's really been wronged and because we protect speech so much, doesn't have a remedy. The only other thing I, I could say is that I really can't talk about the Twitter case okay. <laughs> because it has just been filed. Sure, understood, understood. Um, Larissa, I'd like you to engage on um, the same the same question, but add one more layer to it. You, you have devoted your life um, as an educator, a uh, law school professor, and I think everybody would be quite interested in hearing from your perspective as a law professor, what parts of the doctrine uh, are you struggling to persuade your students to accept today? You know, wh where do you see uh, the weaknesses uh, in their um, understanding and appreciation of, of First Amendment jurisprudence, and what thoughts do you have about what we can do about that in order to restore some of that belief? Yeah. So um, when, you're, when you're teaching law students, it's important to remember law students are just people uh, <laughs> like the rest of us, and so they have some of the same um, uh, biases as the general public. And so one of the things I worry about generally is kind of the, the um, suspicion of the press, the suspicion that the press is, is, is not providing disinterested information in a way that uh, undermines support for press freedom generally, 
and you know increases support for things like overturning New York Times versus Sullivan, which gave a great deal of protection to the press to criticize government officials and to criticize what we might call today influencers, uh, as it was extended by the Supreme Court. Uh, but even more so, the biggest tension I see in students today is they see a big tension between liberty and equality. And so they are much more interested in punishing speech that might be thought to threaten equality. What they see is hate speech. They're much more interested as a, as a whole. These are gross generalizations. There's you know, variations in students like the rest, of the rest of us. But the younger generation sees emotional harm as a threat to their very safety in a way that might justify speech regulations. And you see this slide, right? Speech that's offensive becomes speech that makes me feel unsafe. And so the idea that we have to tolerate that speech as part of living in a democracy, and the idea that we tolerate that speech because we don't know who's gonna be in power the next iteration of elections, and we can't be sure that our side will be in power the next time, and what our side considers offensive you know, may not be the same thing that's considered offensive by the other side. And so that, that tension between equality and liberty comes out differently for a lot of students in the younger generation and convincing them that their views may not win and that they need neutral principles um, to, to adopt so that, you know, to ensure liberty for all of us um, is a harder sale than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And are there things you think we can do to help uh, buttress the belief in First Amendment, uh, the doctrine with this group? I think teaching, his, teaching civics is really important. I teach constitutional law as well as uh, First Amendment law and media law. So seeing the broad sweep of history and understanding that in the cycles of history, there's always an authoritarian impulse to silence that speech with which we disagree and it always, when we look, up, look back on it, ends badly. It's never a good thing. And so history, I think, gives you humility. And it's the only way that these, these uh, Akil on the last panel talked about, indo not indoctrinating, but teaching students about the constitutional principles that bind us together and the importance of holding our elected officials to norms that support those principles. Uh, because we don't know that we'll always be the ones in power and we need some common neutral principles that we can, that will bind us together despite our differences. Thank you. Um, keeping, very good, yeah, all right. And keeping with, with our teaching theme, I think it was Secretary Raimondo who said recently, Jamil, about the TikTok bans. Uh, if you wanna lose, every voter under 35, uh, yeah. go ban TikTok. Um, do you see an opportunity in, in these cases uh, for uh, an, an important opportunity to invigorate this generation with uh, the yeah, importance of absolutely. First Amendment protection? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, well, well first, you know, one thing, uh, Larissa, I've heard, heard you say this before, um, uh, I think it's really important that, that uh, we teach the history of the civil rights movement in connection with free speech because the, the, the truth is the civil rights movement in this country would never have got off the ground but for the freedom of speech. It was the First Amendment that protected that space. Um, and it's much harder to see free speech and equality in opposition once you understand a little bit about that, you know, about that history. But on the TikTok stuff, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are, um, uh, you know, college students, college age students who um, uh, care a lot about access to TikTok because TikTok is uh, a place where they um, themselves post content, they participate in a kind of conversation themselves and they are listeners as well as speakers in that, uh, in that space. And there's a kind of um, uh, kind of dismissiveness I think on the part of uh, some people who don't use uh, TikTok, mostly older people who don't use TikTok, and they think that TikTok is really just about dance videos or, um, 
uh, and it's true, there are some very good dance videos on TikTok. <laughs> but there is a lot more than that on TikTok, uh, including uh, political speech, speech about uh, every topic under the sun uh, is, on, uh, is on TikTok and presented in uh, more ways than you can possibly imagine and in more communities than you can possibly imagine. Um, and a lot of that speech is really valuable, uh, society val uh, a societally val valuable speech, or socially valuable speech, um, uh, even if you think of dance videos as outside that, you know, outside that description. <laughs> um, and these college-age students now see political leaders proposing to, or even actually doing it, banning uh, the access to this platform. Um, and it is perhaps an introduction to um, uh, what free speech means in this country, what the First Amendment means in this country. Uh, I, as, as you know, Bruce, my organization, the Knight Institute, has challenged the constitutionality of Texas's TikTok ban uh, as applied to public university professors because the effect of Texas's ban, uh, which reaches only state employees, uh, one effect of that ban is to prevent public university professors from accessing TikTok in the classroom uh, or um, studying TikTok, uh, including studying, studying the, the uh, problems of disinformation and data collection on TikTok that are ostensibly the justification for the ban in the first place. So, um, uh, but I, I think that, uh, you know, Floyd, Floyd mentioned, I think, quite appropriately that we, we should be concerned about preserving uh, old First Amendment doctrine. One of the cases we're relying on in this case is a case called Lamont versus Postmaster General, uh, which is a 1964, I think, case uh, involving a statute that required people who wanted to receive communist propaganda from abroad to register with the post office uh, before they could receive it. And the Supreme Court struck down that uh, statute saying essentially, uh, unless the government has a very good reason uh, to prevent Americans from uh, accessing information from abroad, uh, it can't prevent them from doing it or burden their right to access that information. And the fact that the government regards this as propaganda is not a good reason. And one of the cases we rely on heavily in our uh, brief challenging the constitutionality of Texas's TikTok ban is, is, is that case. Um, and you know, one of the questions presented in this case is how to apply that principle uh, that was established in Lamont versus Postmaster General 50 years ago to this you know, very new and different, uh, different context. But I do think, to answer your, you know, your, mm -hmm. your question, um, that it's possible that some younger people who haven't yet had occasion to become familiar with the First Amendment or to fall in love with it uh, might become familiar with it and fall in love with it uh, because of uh, these threats to ban a platform that they care a lot about. So the famous phrase, they'll be dancing in the streets, <laughs> uttered after the Times decision, will take right. on new valence, That's right? That's true. After the, true. Right, yeah. the dance videos we'll all mm -hmm. do on TikTok. Um, Floyd, this is a, a, just a perfect setting um, to ask you a question about the work you're now doing um, at Yale Law School uh, on the press clause. Uh, when you announced the project recently, you said, quote, for too long, the provision in the First Amendment that freedom of speech and of the press would be protected from government abridgment has led to justifiably broad protection of the former, but far too little notice of the latter. It is time to begin to address that constitutional deficiency. We're also eager to hear from you about what you are doing with this work and what you'd like to see mm -hmm. come out of it. <clears throat> well, so far we're doing what uh, uh, academics do. We're having conferences. <laughs> uh, 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 now we, we are having a series of conferences around the country with great scholars, uh, which we've done for half a year now. We're doing for another year or so. Uh, hopefully we're going to write something up which might, might persuade someone uh, on some quarter or other. Uh, I mean, we, we, we have, uh, amongst the problems we have, in the, in the country now about a free press, 
is that small newspapers are going out of business. Newspapers in areas which have been served sometimes only by one newspaper and which covers that town, that city, that part of that state uh, are not only not thriving, but, but are rapidly going uh, out of business. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that you know, a lawyer or academic can do about that. Uh, I asked <clears throat> uh, one editor of an Iowa newspaper with a circulation, I think, below 2,000. No, I, I said, I, speaking to you from a lawyer to a journalist, what could we do? Suppose we asked you, what, what would you like? And he said, well, lower mail rates. Uh, I thought, well, <coughs> I can't help with that, you know. Um, the question is, <clears throat> Is there something we can do in the law? Something that, that we can credibly and hopefully uh, persuasively argue that the First Amendment provides, uh, which could at least be of help when these organizations are up against Google uh, or other super large entities uh, which, with which they don't have good relations and would charge them a lot of money and things like, like that. Uh, but, but I don't have a good answer uh, to, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the end of this? I can say that from the beginning of our country, <clears throat> everyone talked about having a free press as being absolutely essential to the preservation uh, of a free society. Uh, James Madison, uh, who had initially been dubious about having a Bill of Rights at all, he said it's just gonna be a, you know, a parchment uh, uh, limitation. Yeah, no, one, no one's gonna pay attention, just be a piece of paper. And he was ultimately persuaded by Jefferson, uh, with whom he was very close and uh, who he, had, he admired, um, and by others, that in order to get the Constitution ratified as it was drafted in Philadelphia, they had to have a Bill of Rights, that there was more and more pressure. And every draft of the Bill of Rights, starting with the first one written by Madison, had a press clause in it, freedom of speech and the press. The first draft, Madison's first draft of the First Amendment in the first Continental Congress on the first day had in it a, a draft of the First Amendment which had language about how the press was inviolable. Press freedom was inviolable, must be inviolable cannot be interfered with. Um, that didn't make all the editing processes. Um, but, but from the start, and certainly with the framers, I mean, they really got the, the essentiality uh, of having a, a press free enough not to be governed by, overseen by, and limited by the newly empowered federal government. I mean, remember, the reason that we have a federal constitution is that the Articles of Confederation didn't work. That, we, we, that each state had its own coins. There was no federal army. There, there were no, any diplomat had to be cleared by all 13 former colonies than now, now states. And, and so there re really was a consensus. Uh, here in Philadelphia, not far from here, there really was a consensus that there was need to, to have uh, a, you know, a written constitution 
uh, and a written constitution which, which dealt with the issues of this brand new country. But at the start, the first vote of the Continental Congress about having a Bill of Rights was 10 states no, no states yes. Three hadn't arrived on their horseback uh, in time. Uh, or the, the others, it was, it, was, it was nine to three. Uh, and <clears throat> that couldn't be confirmed, ratified. There was sufficient opposition by, by members of the Continental Congress and then back in the states that the states would not ratify without a Bill of Rights. And a Bill of Rights, whatever else was in it, would protect freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of religion. And that's the way it became. And yet, we find ourselves now, now back to what I'm active in, with a free press clause which is just not very meaningful. Now, part of that is because we have very expansive protection for free speech. Uh, and so it is not as if we're not a free people without a freer press. But not having a meaningful press clause, not having uh, a individualized protection for the press, the press as opposed to speech alone, would have been a great loss. And we have it, and we're not using it. And what the group that I'm heading is trying to do is, is to make sense of that and to try to come out with some notions uh, about how to put into the press clause as enforced a much greater meaning than it has thus far been given. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Larissa, you're the Floridian on our panel. There never a lack of interesting uh, First Amendment headlines coming out of Florida. But the, the one I wanted to ask you about uh, for this panel uh, takes us back to the right of reply case, Tornillo, decided in the summer of 74. Um, at that moment, access was thought of as coming from, from the left. Uh, Florida now has a new social media law. It's one of those cases we think may go up to the Supreme Court. And I would be curious if you could speak to whether you think the political valence on this issue has shifted uh, from where it was um, during that summer of Tornillo. And also more broadly, just as a constitutional scholar, knowing that Tornillo and other very important First Amendment precedent was established at a time when the press was more popular um, than it is today. Um, the social media companies may be in front of the court at a time when they are not terribly popular. And if you have thoughts about that issue as well and how the, the advocacy is impacted, do you think, by the fact that these cases may arrive at the court at a time when there is, uh, as we've been discussing broadly today, deep societal rifts about First Amendment protection, loss of trust in both the traditional and the new media. How does that, you think, it impact outcomes of the Supreme Court? Well, unfortunately, I think it does impact outcomes. So the press, Lots of our institutions are not very popular with people right now, including the Supreme Court itself. It's at an all-time low in terms of its public popularity and public credibility. Um, but the press, likewise, it, there's, a, there's a great book I would recommend to you called Why Americans Hate the Press and Why It Matters. And the thesis of the book is basically that the dislike of the press and the press practices does make its way into legal proceedings and curbs back in, um, even if you don't have key decisions overturned, the way they're applied gets curbed. You also don't get legislators passing laws that supplement constitutional uh, protections for the press. And then when you have juries deciding cases, for example, defamation cases involving the press, maybe they want to punish the press more. Uh, judges, too, become skeptical of press claims about press freedom. 
But it, what's interesting to me is this is occurring at the same time when it's becoming so evident that we need reliable information. We, the people, need reliable information in order to engage in democratic self-governance. The role of the press in fostering democracy is more evident than ever, and the lack of the, especially at the local level, the press playing this role so we can know what our government officials are up to and call them out on it or vote the rascals out if we need to uh, is so very evident. Uh, it's not surprising in a way that people are concerned about the press. I mean, the press has been, um, my co-author and I said the press, is, the press is decimated, but decimated means like 10%, right? In fact, the press has lost expertise more in the range, like newspapers in particular, about 50% you know, in the last 20 or so years of the expertise has just been, been leached out of newsrooms. And so it's not surprising that maybe the product looks a little different, and especially at the local level, the product doesn't even uh, exist. Um, so I just think that that is something that, that Floyd and, and uh, the Yale folks need to solve. <laughs> <laughs> No, somebody needs to solve it. Um, but, but I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. I think new and different groups are coming in. There's a lot of experience with, uh, experiments with public funding, and the internet does give us some room for experimentation with people gathering information and providing us, it to us in different ways. And you have some, some whistleblowing that's occurred by non-traditional press actors that called out. I mean, I think the Twitter files is... Uh, some of the revelations about what was going on there is akin to a Pentagon Papers revelation, and yet we ha it hasn't had the same resonance. Uh, but the uncovering of, of both the Trump administration and then the Biden administration really coercing social media to, to put their narrative across is something that I think is serious that, that did not come out of traditional press actors. Um, yeah, no, that's great. I, um, I think we have time for probably one more question that, that I could ask uh, of the whole panel. And you know, it's hard not to be in the setting <clears throat> and not think about the majestic words from Sullivan of the central meaning of the First Amendment and the, um, the artifice, you know, the image it created in our minds of the, the fourth estate um, and the press as the uh, bulwark of democracy. And, um, but we're clearly shifting into a different era. And we've, teased a, uh, uh, a bit here on this panel about um, with technological change, um, as, as Floyd uh, hinted, the op chance that the court will take some really important cases um, in the coming years. And what do each of you um, think that the emerging digital First Amendment um, will look like? And I'm asking that question uh, in a week in which the Justice Department is trying to break Google apart um, and so there's this backdrop of the concentration of power of, of the tech companies in our speech marketplace. And if you have the opportunity to speak to that in your answer as well. All in a handful of minutes, sorry. Ajimu, you want to go first? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess I would, I would start by going back to where I began, which was with the values that the First Amendment was, was meant to protect. I, I don't actually think that it's that easy to take, even if you are 100% confident that the Supreme Court got it right in these cases decided 50 years ago, like Brandenburg or uh, the Pentagon Papers case or New York Times versus Sullivan, even if you feel in your bones that those decisions were 100% right, there's still a hard task in applying those principles to this very different factual landscape that we're, we're dealing with now. Like, you can believe in the First Amendment and in those principles implicitly and still not know how some of these cases should come out. Um, I think that the net choice cases, which have been you know, alluded to a couple times without actually been, being identified, there are these two cases out of Florida and Texas uh, Florida and Texas have these new social media laws that regulate social media companies. They uh, uh, require the companies to carry some content even when the companies don't want to carry it. And they also require the companies to be more transparent uh, about their content moderation policies than they would like to be. 
Uh, this question of how to apply 50-year-old precedents like Miami Herald versus Tornillo to social media companies is not a straightforward one uh, at all. You know, on the one hand, if you read Tornillo to mean the government can't uh, force editors, understood in the broadest sense, uh, to make decisions that the editors don't want to make, you know, can't force editors' hands, then these laws are obviously constitutional. The Texas law and the Florida law, I mean, that's exactly what the government is doing here, right? Those governments are telling Florida, uh, telling Twitter and Facebook uh, what content they need to publish. So if that's your reading of Tornillo, then it's relatively straightforward. But there are a lot of differences between social media companies and newspapers, and figuring out uh, which of those differences should matter, whether any of them should matter, um, uh, is, a really, is a really difficult task. And I think that uh, how the court answers those questions um, is gonna make a huge difference to what the digital um, landscape looks like over the, next, uh, over the next 20 years. And you know, we're all here because at some level we um, uh, are enthusiasts of the First Amendment. You know, we all believe in the centrality of free speech to our society. Uh, I think most of us probably believe that free speech and democracy are almost synonymous. Um, uh, but you can believe all those things and still have a hard time figuring out how these cases should be decided. So I think it's very difficult to predict what the Supreme Court will do. Um, and, uh, you know, not not always obvious, even to people who, who care about free speech. Well, I'd like to, just a word more on social media. <clears throat> we haven't talked about this Section 230 of the federal law which governs this, which basically immunizes social media uh, against uh, libel claims for what people say on social media. It was intended to, and it has. Uh, allowed social media to explode in, in terms of its ability to, to put, in effect, people on while the social media entity doesn't have to check it. The New York Times has to check it. Uh, they even have to check it when the person is a public person in, in many uh, circumstances. And whether we're going to continue to have that, uh, uh, I don't know, but we should, and, and I'm not even advocating one, one thing or the other. A final note for me, and now we, uh, we have, I want to save you time. If I had to tell you one thing you ought to tell your children when you go home tonight, it's that Salman Rushdie spoke to you. Yeah. Uh, and Larissa, what would be the, what you would tell your class next time you convene? Well, so last term in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court dealt with at least two very significant internet-related cases. And Elena Kagan famously said at oral argument, well, we're not the nine greatest experts on the internet. <laughs> and so I'm going to leave you with a little optimism. Because here's the thing. They waited a long, we've been dealing with adapting First Amendment principles to the internet for more than 25 years now. It's a long time. And the Supreme Court's been reluctant to wade in. There aren't that many cases, but they're finally starting to take some, which you know, makes us a little trepidatious. But, but when they adapt, in Counterman versus Colorado, which dealt with threats last term, they were very sensitive to the misinterpretation that you could put on threats in an internet context, and they, they uh, set mens rea standards high so that we didn't accidentally punish speech that wasn't really a threat. And then they rejected the invitation to uh, make you know, Twitter responsible for all extremism on the internet generated by its algorithms. And so they're, they're really trying to be careful in the adaptation of these principles. And it gives me a little hope, as, as Jamil said, the point is the principles. And uh, we reason by analogy, but sometimes the big tech uh, companies are not really analogous to anything we've seen before. They're kind of like newspapers. They're kind of like common carriers. They're kind of like this. They're kind of like that. Um, so hopefully the Supreme Court will be modest 
in their own abilities and be very careful in that adaptation process this term. Well, thank you. I think the three of you are a pretty great three-judge panel. I'd like to see you making the law. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks, Bruce.